Have you ever heard someone say that the reason that you can't lose weight is because of your thyroid and thought to yourself, what even is the thyroid? Well, today we're going to talk about it. I'll see you inside. So to start off, the thyroid itself is actually a gland or just a group of cells. and It actually sits below that lump in your neck that's often referred to as the Adam's apple. And there are two main hormones in humans that are really responsible for the effects of the thyroid. And this is T3, or triiodothyronine, and T4, also called thyroxine. And now T3 and T4 are actually both composed of tyrosine and iodine. T3, as the name might imply, contains three molecules of iodine. And T4, as the name implies, contains four molecules of iodine which is pretty easy to remember. And now T4 is typically considered the inactive form of thyroid, and T3 is considered the active form of thyroid. So we take T4 and we just remove an iodine and create T3, which actually has most of the biological effects within our body. And now to produce T3, there's actually a series of signals that goes through what's referred to as the hypothalamic pituitary axis, and you may have heard of this referred to as the HPA axis. And once a few different processes occur, we come out on the other side with T3 and T4 secreted into the bloodstream by the thyroid gland. And there are a few steps that are actually required first, and additionally, the production of thyroid hormone actually begins in the hypothalamus. Um, which is a brain region that is in the most part responsible for maintaining what's referred to as homeostasis. So it's actually going to regulate our hunger, body temperature, heart rate, and other functions that we don't actually think about by modulating the nervous system in our hormonal production. For example, if our body temperature decreases, we'll produce specific hormones that will increase our body temperature, and vice versa. And now the hypothalamus doesn't actually directly send signals to the thyroid gland. Rather, it will actually send signals to the pituitary gland. And this is just a subsection of the brain at the bottom of the hypothalamus that is the true location of most hormonal production. And then the pituitary gland will eventually interact with the thyroid gland to uptake the necessary nutrients for thyroid hormone production. And this whole process is referred to as the hypothalamic pituitary axis. So in terms of thyroid, the hypothalamus actually contains neurons, which are just cells within the brain that send chemical signals throughout the body. And within the hypothalamus, there's a subset of neurons called the paraventricular nucleus. And these neurons produce a chemical called thyrotropin releasing hormone, or TRH. There's actually a subsection of veins between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland that allows this TRH to travel directly into the pituitary gland. And this system is called the hypophyseal portal system. So TRH will travel to and enter the pituitary gland and actually excite a group of cells called the thyrotropic cells. So the TRH stimulates these cells to begin producing another hormone called thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH, and the name kind of explains its function. And now some people may actually be familiar with TSH because it's actually often the hormone we use to measure on a blood test as a surrogate marker for thyroid production. And the reason for this is because people have different levels of thyroid that the body feels comfortable at. And it's thought that whenever the body is in an uncomfortable state in which it's not producing the thyroid that it wants, it will increase the production of TSH to try and stimulate more and more thyroid. And if it has too much, it will drastically decrease the production of TSH to stop producing as much thyroid so we can get back into this little Goldilocks zone that the body feels comfortable at. With that being said, this system isn't always perfect, so I oftentimes recommend people get an entire thyroid panel done and have their doctor help them interpret it. So TSH doesn't really do all that much. It's simply just signaling the thyroid to either produce more or less thyroid. And then the hypothalamus will send the TSH into the bloodstream, and it will bind to a receptor on a specific subsection of cells on the exterior of the thyroid, called thyroid follicular cells. 
And the receptor has a very convenient name. It's called the TSH receptor. And TSH does not actually enter into the cell. Rather, it causes a cascade of events inside of the cell that actually leads to thyroid hormone production. So the TSH receptor is a specific type of receptor that you may have heard me discuss on a previous podcast called a G-protein coupled receptor. And to kind of put it simply, a G-protein receptor has a receptor on the outside of the membrane and little proteins attached on the inside of the membrane. And when TSH binds to the receptor, one of these proteins is actually released. And this protein goes and interacts with a specific enzyme called adenylyl cyclase. And this enzyme will actually take ATP and convert it into a molecule called cyclic AMP. And when we have this cyclic AMP floating around, this molecule will interact with another enzyme called PKA. And at least for G proteins, PKA really is the, the enzyme that is going to make a lot of the functions actually occur. So we have molecules of phosphate inside of our cells, and these phosphate molecules kind of just get thrown around between enzymes and molecules, and when the phosphates attach, they either turn on or turn off a specific function. And in this case, what PKA does is it actually takes these phosphates and adds it to specific enzymes to make them start functioning or to inhibit them from functioning. And in terms of the thyroid, PKA actually phosphorylates what's referred to as a transcription factor, and these things are really cool. So transcription factors are just small pieces of protein that actually go into our DNA and will bind to specific pieces of DNA, and these pieces of DNA actually code for the production of specific protein, and in this case, these transcription factors will bind to the piece that is going to produce the thyroid hormones. So this is a way of the body not overproducing thyroid. So the transcription factors are left dormant when they're not activated by this PKA. And then when they are activated, they enter the DNA and will start producing the thyroid hormone. And then once the signal or the TSH is no longer pressing on the TSH receptor, these G proteins will kind of resort back to their resting state and PKA will be, for lack of a better word, turned off and then will turn off the transcription factor and stop producing thyroid. But for now we have this transcription factor turned on and we're going to kind of look at the process of producing T3 and T4 which are the thyroid hormones. And now unfortunately I'm going to have to take you back to high school biology just for a quick second but I promise it won't be that bad. So this transcription factor doesn't actually directly produce thyroid hormone. Rather, it's going to actually produce what's called mRNA. And this mRNA is taken to the ribosome by what's referred to as a nuclear envelope. And the mRNA is then changed a little bit and transcribed in the endoplasmic reticulum and sent to the Golgi apparatus, where it packs and fully develops the protein into a vesicle. And this vesicle is kind of like a taxi, and inside of the taxi, at the moment, we have a protein called thyroglobulin. And this little taxi carrying our thyroglobulin will actually bind to and fuse to the membrane of a thyroid cell. And then the thyroglobulin is actually kind of shuttled to the interstitial, or the innermost portion of the thyroid gland, where the thyroid hormones are actually produced. And this little portion is called the follicular lumen. So if you remember, the receptor is actually located on the surface of the thyroid. And then it's kind of like there are two layers of the thyroid. And the process of actually transcribing the DNA occurs in the outermost layer. And then we shuttle this thyroglobulin protein into the intermost layer to be turned into the thyroid hormone. And now thyroglobulin is tyrosine but we now need to add iodine onto the tyrosine in order to make the thyroid hormone. The only problem is this iodine doesn't just sit in this innermost space. It's actually inside of the bloodstream as long as we're getting in enough from our diet. 
So we now have to locate iodine in the bloodstream and get that into this follicular lumen. And now, iodine in the bloodstream is actually typically in a form of iodide. And all this means is it typically has an extra electron. And the reason this is important is because, because iodide has an additional electron, it can actually bind to a molecule of sodium. And then this kind of complex can bind to a protein on the thyroid cell called pendrin, which will actually use sodium to pump the iodide into the follicular space. However, as I, as I mentioned, this iodide actually has an extra electron. So if you want to be exact, iodide has 54 electrons and iodine has 53. And the one thing to remember in biology is that Molecules like to be stable, meaning they have the same amount of protons and electrons. And iodine has 53 electrons and 53 protons, but iodide has 53 protons and 54 electrons, so it has an extra electron. And I know this sounds minute and unimportant, but within our physiology, it's actually very important because these extra electrons can actually go around and cause what's referred to as oxidation and start damaging cells. But have no fear because there's an enzyme in the follicular lumen called TPO or thyroid peroxidase, which will actually oxidize the iodide. And oxidation is simply just a process of taking this extra electron and transferring it to a molecule that's missing an electron. And specifically in this case, it will transfer it to oxygen. Therefore, iodide loses an electron and we now have a stable molecule of iodine. Not only that, but this TPO does much, much more. So this TPO will take the iodine and it will link it to a tyrosine molecule. And now we have one iodine on a tyrosine molecule called monoiodotyrosine. And you can simply just think of this as being T1. And it can also create T2 by simply just attaching two iodines to a tyrosine molecule. And then it'll basically take these two molecules that it's created and shove them together, creating T3 and T4. If it attaches two T2 molecules, then it will create T4. If it attaches a T1 and a T2 together, then now we have T3. And this is why inside of the thyroid, we actually produce about an 80-20 ratio of T4, meaning 80% T4 and 20% T3. However, this thyroglobulin is actually just a big, long molecule of about 67 tyrosine molecules. So now these T3 and T4 are kind of just dangling on to this very long molecule. So what we do is we actually kind of chop off this molecule using what are referred to as proteolytic enzymes. And the rest of the tyrosine are just used to make more T3 and T4. And then we kind of cut off this T3 and T4 that's already formed. And now these T3 and T4 molecules can go into the bloodstream and travel to places where they're needed. But it's important to note that they actually travel inside the bloodstream inside of proteins. And these proteins include thyroxine binding globulin, or TBG, thyroxine binding prealbumin, TBPA, or just albumin. And these are just proteins that can transport these thyroid molecules. So now we finally have thyroid inside of the bloodstream, and it's time to see what they do. So thyroid molecules are used everywhere. There isn't just one single location that they'll dock to and cause all of the effects. It actually depends on which tissue the thyroid binds to as to what it effect actually is. And now how exactly T3 and T4 get into a cell is actually kind of debated at the moment, but it used to be thought that they would just diffuse or enter freely without a transporter, but it seems now that there are T3 and T4 transporters on cells, which may explain why some cells uptake these molecules better than others. With that being said, I will not give you a definitive answer on that, as I just simply do not know. However, it does appear that this is a sodium-dependent process, so sodium may actually be required to facilitate the thyroid hormones into the cells. But when they're actually inside of the cell, I mentioned that T3 is the active form of thyroid hormone. 
and T4 must be modulated into T3 inside of the cell before it can have any effects. And now this process is pretty simple. There's what's referred to as a 5-diiodinase enzyme inside of a cell, and it just removes one of the iodine from T4, turning it into T3. And now, T3 doesn't really act alone. Rather, it seems to work with arachidonic acid inside of a cell to turn on specific transcription factors. So if you remember how thyroid was produced, there's actually a transcription factor that transcribes the protein required to make thyroid. And thyroid does the same thing inside of a cell. It will actually bind to another transcription factor that causes the production of different proteins inside of the cell. And the real function of these proteins is to increase the metabolism of the cell. So depending on the tissue, the transcription factor that the thyroid hormone will turn on has differing effects. However, all of these effects seem to increase protein synthesis. And the proteins that are synthesized are things like sodium-potassium channels. And these proteins will actually orient themselves and kind of dock into the outside of a cell. And they increase the rate that sodium will exit the cell and increase the rate that potassium enters the cell. However, for this to occur, it actually requires ATP. And as you may know, ATP is kind of the energy currency of the cell. So simply having more of these pumps means that we're going to use more ATP and the cell will actually be expending more energy. And the more thyroid we have, the more of these pumps we will create, thus the metabolic rate of a cell will actually increase. And what this does is it allows us to consume more oxygen so we can create more ATP. Additionally, heat is actually produced as a byproduct of the production of ATP. And this seems to be why our internal body temperature will begin to increase when our thyroid levels increase. Our thyroid will actually increase our oxygen consumption and the production of energy. It also appears that it will have an effect on increasing our mitochondrial function. So just because we uptake more oxygen doesn't mean we're going to inevitably make more ATP. We actually need to have more of these factories or powerhouses that are called mitochondria that will take the oxygen and the nutrients and turn it into ATP. And now this is really interesting. So as I mentioned, we'll have more of these sodium potassium channels and they'll actually be using more of the ATP that's inside of the cell. So for a period of time, we'll actually have a state of low ATP and low energy levels inside of a cell. And the cell will actually adapt to this by increasing the production of mitochondrias, making more mitochondria. And then we can use more oxygen and create ATP at a quicker rate. And this truly is the kind of impetus of increasing our metabolic rate. It is simply having more mitochondria consuming more oxygen, and creating more ATP. But so far, I've only talked about oxygen and then the eventual production of ATP, but obviously there's a process of needing fuel and being able to utilize the fuel and turn it into ATP in the first place. And luckily, this thyroid hormone will actually bind to fat cells and muscle cells and also liver cells, and it will cause an increase in lipolysis, glycogenolysis, and gluconeogenesis. Lipolysis is simply the act of burning body fat. Glycogenolysis is the act of taking stored glucose and pushing it into the bloodstream. And gluconeogenesis is taking molecules that aren't yet glucose, turning them into glucose, and pushing those into the bloodstream as well. And this is referred to as the mobilization of fuel, and it is simply taking the fuel that we have inside of our body and making it available to be uptaken by cells. So now we have greater machinery to make energy. We are uptaking more oxygen so that we will be able to cleanly make energy, and we have more fuel inside of our bloodstream to create energy from. And this entire process is the reason why thyroid hormone seems to increase our metabolic rate. And the other thing you may actually notice if, let's say, you had taken a thyroid medication is that it seems to also increase blood pressure and heart rate. And now the symptoms of having high blood pressure and a high heart rate 
He is correlated with hyperthyroidism, meaning a high amount of thyroid, and having low blood pressure and a low heart rate is a symptom of hypothyroidism, meaning not enough thyroid hormone. And this is because on the heart there are specific receptors referred to as beta-1 adrenergic receptors. And T3 will actually increase the synthesis of these receptors. And this simply makes the heart more what's referred to as adrenaline sensitive. Because there are more receptors on the heart, adrenaline has an easier and quicker time binding to them. So adrenaline will bind to different sections of the heart and increase what's referred to as our cardiac output, which is simply just the amount of blood that we're pushing out of the heart. And it will also increase our heart rate by binding to the SA node. And that is actually all I have in my notes for today. So I think today's episode is kind of just trying to explain all of the things that arise when people talk about having low or having high thyroid. So that is really all I have in my notes for today. And I hope this kind of just helps explain all of those symptoms that are often correlated with having too much thyroid or not enough thyroid. And maybe giving you a bit of a better understanding of why the thyroid is correlated to an increased metabolism, an increased body temperature, increased blood pressure, and increased heart rate. All of these functions occur naturally, and thyroid simply just increases or decreases the rate at which we make the necessary nutrients and enzymes to upregulate or downregulate these processes. It's kind of just the speed and veracity at which all of these things occur. So this is why people who have a low thyroid typically will be tired. And it just simply just seems like their body is functioning at a slower rate than someone with hyperthyroidism. And from a physiological level, this is actually true. So that being said, I'm going to leave this one here. And I really hope you enjoyed and took a few things away from it. And of course, I want to say thank you for listening, and I hope to see you on the next episode. Have a